You've got a dead man in another dead man's bosom and, and another dead man on fire and, and uh, a dead man praying to another dead man for another dead man to be sent to him, <laughs> sent, to, sent to his brothers. You can't make all that literal. There was a certain rich man. The rich man is unnamed because he represents a multitude. The rich man here is typical of the leadership of Israel. In other words, it's the government. The government of Israel was the rich man. The the government of Israel, by the way, what wasn't taken care of by the Roman government was, was the priesthood, the scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees. They were the leadership of Israel. And they were wealthy in the things of God. It's not so much talking about riches, natural riches, but they were rich in the things of God. In another place, Jesus said, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Moses' seat was the seat of rulership. They had authority. They had the esteem of the people. And uh, they were in a position of uh, the priesthood of the Old Testament. They were still carrying that tradition on. And they had the obedience of the people, clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. Again, he's not so much talking about their natural feasting as the symbolic good things that they had. They had the rulership over Israel. But further on down here, it's, uh, well, let's just proceed on reading. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Now, it's significant that he did name the beggar. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the rich man's gate. And let's deal with that name, first of all. Lazarus is is a Hebrew expression best translated as he whom God helps. It's a derivation of Eliezer or Eleazar, a better pronunciation of it. He whom God helps. The beggar here represents Jesus. He was laid at the rich man's gate. And we've been... This is a natural objection. Nearly everybody raises it when they first hear this. What did the scribes and Pharisees have that Jesus wanted? Because it said he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. What, the, what they had that Jesus wanted was the attention and obedience of the people. Jesus wanted to be heard, understood, and followed. The scribes and Pharisees had all that. They were in charge of Israel. Jesus was laid at their gate like a beggar. He didn't have anything. Even literally, take it literally. Jesus slept on the ground many times when the scribes and Pharisees were in their, in their beds. In fact, there's one chapter in John where they were discussing Jesus and what to do with him after, I think it's after he had raised Lazarus from the dead. They were trying to figure out what to do with him. It seemed like one chapter closes there. After they finished their discussion, said every man went to his own house. The next verse, if I remember right, says Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Jesus and his men, they slept out on the Mount of Olives while the leaders of Israel were sleeping in their warm beds. 
by the way, it was cold usually in early April over there, and especially at night. Full of sores. Lazarus was laid at his gate full of sores. This is spiritually. Jesus was suffering constantly. He suffered a lot of things spiritually, suffering the rejection of the, the, especially the leadership and even the general populace. It was a fairly small percentage of the people that he had following him. Sometimes he'd have a crowd of maybe 10 or 15,000 on a special occasion, but he couldn't get very many people together very many times. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. I already explained that. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The dogs here represent the Gentiles. The dogs came and licked his sores. Why would dogs lick a beggar's sores? It's not because they feel sorry for the beggar. It's just because something about those sores that taste good to a dog. In this case, what Jesus had to offer, what he was suffering to present and maintain was the power and wisdom of God. And you have several examples of uh, Gentile people wanting what he had, especially the Main example is the woman from Zarephath when uh, the, he and his, Jesus and his disciples were taking a little weekend vacation out of the land of Israel. They went up there into the land of uh, Sidon and Tyre to a little town called Zarephath. And there's where a Gentile woman came to him begging him to heal her daughter whom she had left at home. And Jesus insulted her. He said, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. And that had been his position before he was speaking to the Gentiles, was speaking to his own disciples when he sent them out to preach. He said, we're not sent uh, to the Gentiles or the whole world. We're sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was Jesus' ministry, was to Israel. He was fulfilling the promises made to Abraham and David and uh, bringing the gospel to Israel. The Gentiles were to come in later. But Jesus, went in, in his earthly mission, was not ministering to the Gentiles. But he was testing this woman, no doubt, and instead of reacting to the insult she humbly replied truth Lord but even the dogs desire to eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table she was still begging for her daughter and thus Jesus was overcome by her humble spirit he couldn't deny her any longer he said oh woman Great is your faith. Be it unto you as you will. And she went home and her daughter was well. So that was an example of the dogs licking Lazarus' sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Abraham here represents God. He's just, God's everybody's father. Abraham was the the Jews' father. He was the Israelites' father, but God is everybody's father. Abraham's bosom is the bosom of God. And that's where Jesus went when he died. The beggar died on the cross. And he resurrected and was carried by angels. Literally. I don't guess they had to carry him, but they came and escorted him back into heaven into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. The rich man died in A.D. 70. And he's been in hell ever since. 
The Jews and their leadership has been driven from pillar to post, from hither to yon, without a homeland until a few years ago, 1947, 48, the world finally granted the Jews a small corner of Palestine again, their ancient homeland. The Jews are going home. But this covers that time period before now. In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off. They used to could see Abraham close up. God had been close to them for centuries, and they were spoiled by that. Now, for 2,000 years, they've been looking for God, and he's afar off. They can't get close to him. They're still not back in full favor with God yet. Being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, Lazarus, remember, represents Christ, the Jews' Messiah. And here they cry in prayer, saying, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, our Messiah. Send our Messiah. They, they're praying that. They don't really pray, send Jesus. They don't know who they're praying for. They're praying for God to send Jesus back to them when they pray for the Messiah. And it'll finally happen. Their prayer will finally get answered. But there's a space that can't be crossed over until it's passed. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Brother Patton used to show how ridiculous that is to take it literally. A man in the flames of hell would beg for more than a drop of water on his tongue. He'd need water all over. Why my tongue? Again, it's just that they don't know what they're praying for or how to pray for it. When they pray for Jesus to come, they're praying for Jesus' kingdom to come. They're to be in it. And uh, the Holy Ghost. The Jew needs the Holy Ghost. He wants a drop of water on his tongue so he can get the Holy Ghost. He doesn't know that, but he knows he needs something from God. He needs something he doesn't have. Cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. I think it's the 15th chapter of Ezekiel that ends up saying, uh, predicting that Israel and Jerusalem would be out of one flame into another. They've been that way for 2,000 years. But Abraham, or God, said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things. Likewise, Lazarus received evil things. But now he's comforted and you're tormented. Thou art tormented. And beside all this, between you and us, there's a great gulf fixed. We say that's a gulf of time. God has a certain time fixed before he will return to the Jew and deal with him spiritually again. So that they which would pass from here to you cannot, and for all these 2,000 years there's been missionaries trying to preach to the Jews. They couldn't reach them. The Jews' heart was closed. Neither can they pass to us that would come from there. Then he said, the Jew, the, the rich man said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, the house of uh, all Israel including what some people call the lost tribes. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. The five brethren, we've always said, were 
those lost tribes out in the dispersion. They're not really lost. Uh, they know who they are, and God knows who they are. And, and uh, some of the New Testament writers, apostles, wrote letters to them. But uh, we say that's uh, the Jews that went out and were scattered into all nations in the five different dispersions that they've suffered in five kingdoms hitherto. You know, there are seven kingdoms to deal with uh, God's people. But the first five were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. Now, the sixth one is Rome, and that's who's in this flame. The, the Jews that Rome conquered and wiped out in A.D. 70, and they've, uh, most of them have been tormented under the Roman Catholic rulership and and uh, system throughout the Dark Ages. And so they, they've been suffering under Rome ever since, until now. Lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Well, one went unto them from the dead. Jesus actually appeared to them again after he resurrected. But they didn't receive him after, the, after he died on the cross, and most of them, any more than they did before he died on the cross. Except those that he brought in from the day of Pentecost on up until A.D. 70, he did build a church in Israel for a witness. And that was Jesus appearing to Israel again after he died and resurrected. They had a, another 40 years or so of that early church until AD 70. They lost their temple, their location, their city, and everything. So, that's a parable. How do you like the parable? Jesus was a good parable teller. Jesus told that parable. <clears throat> so that main verse we was pointing out is verse 23. In hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. That's the main phrase. The hell he was in was torment, suffering. That whole generation had been in. Anyway, that was a question that was generated. It's one of the main questions when that comes up. One more comment on that is that there are some good books give the history of the Jews from uh, A.D. 70 up until now. You can read in there, if you like, all the things they've suffered in the European countries during the Dark Ages. And all the way up to Hitler. They were still... That was another flame the Jews went into in World War II. If you read the news, they're still in the flame. They're still in the fire. All right, we've had questions text in. Does anybody... I'll open it up for anybody here in the room if you have any questions. Uh, I don't have names with me. I'll have to get them later. I think Hall is one of the writers. Who? Hall, H-U-L-L. Uh, 
I've got some of them in my library. I'll just have to look them up. My, my, the, the writing on my brain is fading out. Turn Brother Patrick's mic on. Brother Brown, I'd like to inject something right here. I always found interesting on the subject of hell. It's in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the 19th chapter, the fifth verse. They have built also high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal. And this is the part that I like. Which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. And he says that same thing in Jeremiah 32nd chapter, the 35th verse. Neither spake it, nor came it into my mind. And my point is, if it never came into God's mind for the Jews to burn their children in the fire, why would God burn his children in fire? You're talking about literal fire. Yes, sir. Literal fire. That falls under the subject of hell, doesn't it? Has any questions? Hang on, they need to bring you the mic. Who, who's running the mic? I just have a question, brethren. Um, I'm just curious. If people believe in a literal hell, um, you know, we understand it's not a literal hell, <clears throat> but a lot of people do. But some of those people still try to live holy. Does that make them... Will they miss out on God because they believe in a literal hell? Which, and it's not a literal hell, but they still try to live holy. Yeah, I, there's been, uh, really, I guess this is uh, something we studied out in the 20th century. There's been generations of people throughout the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, that believed in a literal hell. They had not much teaching. Most of them had no access to the Bible. Very few of them did. And uh, that doesn't keep them from getting a resurrection. Just that it's something that everybody does need to get straightened out on sooner or later because that does not glorify God. That teaching does not glorify God. You can't justify God in treating people that severely. Nobody's done anything. You can't do enough in a short lifetime to deserve eternity and that kind of torment. So that uh, dishonors God to teach it that way. But my father and I taught it that way a long time. We just didn't think of that.
in the room, don't don't text me questions. Stand up and ask them if you don't mind. <laughs> Go ahead, Chip. You realize we used to have services like this? This is the way we did it out in Port Houston when I came in. On a Sunday, Brother Patton would be taking questions from the audience. Said They'd send notes in, and sometimes they'd stand up and ask a question. We used to have our Sunday services like that. I like it. My, my question is, actually I got this from a good brother Revelation 6, 6. <clears throat> I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So, <clears throat> a penny, when Jesus hired the laborers, I've been taught a penny whether you were hired early in the day or late, you get paid a penny, which is eternal life. And in this scripture, is a penny eternal life in this scripture? Can you get eternal, and if so, can you get eternal life by barley? I hope I'm making my question clear. Well, um... One thing he's showing there is that some points are more important than others. Some doctrines are more important than others. We've, uh, we've said barley represents tradition. And uh, during this period prophesied here, there was three times as much barley as there was wheat. But... Uh, even barley represents religious tradition, and, and so, like I said, said about the teaching on hell, that may have been some of the barley, and we use that to try to frighten people into getting saved, and on some of people, I guess it worked. It's a, Help get people to church back in that time when they didn't know any better. Nobody had any better argument. But a penny really is a day's work in other contexts, maybe not in this one, but a penny in that parable about the penny at the end of the day just it represents your day's work. Your day is your lifetime. You work for God in your day and you get your penny at the end of the day like everybody else, whether you started early or late. and of religion or even false doctrine there are people out in religion that are living all they know they're serving God to the best of their ability and their understanding and it might be barley but God is merciful they're honest hearted and they're, they're living after the integrity and the sincerity of their heart and God is not unjust that he would uh, leave them without a reward for their effort and their labor in, uh, in their lifetime. That's what the second resurrection or the final resurrection is for, so that they can finish their judgment with the truth, with a better understanding. They'll come up, they'll go into the church, they'll receive instruction, and they'll begin to judge their lives. And in that, straightened out in the resurrection. Amen. <laughs> Mike.
she came to him in the barley harvest. She went down in the threshing floor during the barley harvest. And in the second chapter, at the end of the second chapter, it talks about both the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. They're both grains that make meal. So in, in that, I have a hard time seeing that barley is false doctrine. You may have a point. God has always fed his people enough to keep them alive. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Could you elaborate on what that word substance means in that context? She wants to talk on that. I want you to explain that verse. That is uh, always difficult to make clear. That's a real powerful verse there. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. He's showing the, partly showing the importance of faith. Faith is basic to salvation. I'm going to give you my definition or a description of faith. Faith is the difference between wish and hope. You can wish for things you know you're never going to get. Most of us do. So it's something you can't have any faith for. But the things we want from God the things that God has promised to give us, we may want some things from God that he doesn't want to give us for various reasons. But he's going to give us everything eventually. And our faith in those promises is what gives us hope of eventually, ultimately, ending up with all things, all the promises of God fulfilled. It keeps us from just uh, dying with unfulfilled wishes. And then he gives examples through the rest of that chapter of people who accomplish things by faith. They could have sat at home and wished for deliverance from all those different enemies, different things. But somebody had faith enough to follow God and risk their lives in fighting for deliverance. Those are part of the examples in there. So he's trying to, in this passage and in this chapter, inspire us to exercise our faith and cling to our faith and don't, don't let uh, false reasoning undermine your faith. Don't let uh, the passage of time, seemingly the postponement of your, of your hopes, don't let that weaken your faith that eventually you're going to get what God promised.
meaning like the promises like eternal life. What did she say? Exactly, that's the main part. Um, I have a question. Uh, so we know that we have influence with God, you know, for living right, all these kinds of things. We have influence with God. We can, um, there's evidence in the Bible that we can change God's mind. Um, we can store up mercy with God so much so that he'll even use it for future generations like our children and things like that. So my question is, when it comes to someone who has perished and maybe their, their judgment's not complete, um, do you think we have any sway or influence with God when it comes to their resurrection? Like if he hasn't, I don't know how that works, if he's already decided at their passing, or I guess I'm just wondering if, you know, any sort of prayer or um, influence or mercy stored up has any sort of sway with God in deciding who's going to, resurrect I see your point and of course the Catholic Church emphasizes that idea of praying for the praying for the dead but I can't see any encouragement in the Bible for doing that I'm, I'm not going to criticize it too strongly I've known personally people that were so affected by the death of a loved one that they continued to pray for that person. I've even felt like doing it myself. <laughs> Lord, be good to that person in the resurrection. But I'm not sure how effective that is. I don't think it's necessary. I think when a person finishes their course here, and God takes them on out in death, that, uh, of course, God can't deal with them now while they're dead. So everything can wait till the resurrection. When they wake up in the resurrection, you can start praying for them again, would be my answer. Since this has come up, we're getting a lot of questions in about would we explain the horses? We came, kind of came in in the middle there. Four horses? Yeah. Revelation 6. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And frankly, I'm not sure we have everything that goes with what we have on this, but 
we've had a few points on these horses that have uh, seemed like stayed with us ever since Brother Souter's day. So we haven't come up with anything better. I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, there were seven seals that he saw in heaven, and the lamb had the power to break the seals. The seals represent the word of God, particularly the sealed up things of God, the prophecies. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And when you're studying that, you want to note the resemblances between each beast and the horse it introduces. They both go together. The beast and the horse go together. And both of them have characteristics that help signify their place in the order. Uniting them in time dispensations. We see these four beasts and their four horses as dispensations of time. And they're the dispensations that span the 2,000 year, most of the 2,000 year period since the New Testament. So, the white horse dispensation, we say, Note that other places in Revelations where a white horse is shown. In the 19th chapter, the rider on the white horse is Jesus. Jesus comes riding a white horse. That's symbolic, of course. All oh, this is symbolic. In fact, this is one of the main clues to studying the book of Revelations is to realize, recognize that nearly everything in Revelations is John's vision, something he saw in a vision. And when you study dreams and visions throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, they're nearly always to be taken symbolically. No dream or vision hardly ever contains anything literal. Just start with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, not Nebuchadnezzar, but Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh's dreams that got Joseph out of jail. There was uh, starving cows eating up the fat cows. Well, that's symbolic. And dreams and visions from their own are nearly all fulfilled symbolically. So that the book of Revelation is, looked like one long vision that John had, or series of visions. Note that nearly everything in here is symbolic. Hardly anything in Revelation is to be taken literally except perhaps numbers. I haven't found any way to symbolize numbers per se. The Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as of the noise of thunder one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. We're looking at Jesus here, leading, leading out in a dispensation. I say, we've said for years, there's people saying other things now, but this still looks good to me. The white horse dispensation ran from A.D. 30 to about A.D. 100, about the lifetime of the apostles. Some of them may have lived that long. That uh, 100 A.D. may not be exact, but it's a round number about that time 
when the changeover from the early church to the falling away took place. The falling away of the church began about that time with the death of the last of the apostles. A white horse, he that sat on him had a bow. What is a bow? What is a bow for? It's to shoot arrows with, isn't it? What kind of arrows does Jesus shoot? I say he shoots promises. He's got a bow in his hand and he shoots promises. He shoots us with promises. And he fulfilled some promises while he was in the bargain back in that early church. That early church was fulfilling the promises made in the Old Testament, the promises made to the fathers. It's what we're trying to restore today. We're trying to get Jesus' bow strung up with arrows again. crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering that was Jesus that church Jesus was in that church and it was conquering people were conquering themselves glory you can conquer yourself biggest battle you'll ever fight is with yourself Woo. I like that And to conquer, to conquer again later on, someday, sometime in the future. We're still, we're looking for the Lord to come back conquering in a, in a church again. We're trying to build that church where you can conquer yourself. Manifest Christ. He conquered himself. Glory to his name. A.D. 30 to A.D. 100. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. Come look. And there went out another horse that was red. Red's color of sin and the flesh. And of blood and suffering. Power was given to him that sat on that horse. That wasn't Jesus. Somebody else was sitting on that horse to take peace from the earth. That they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. There was a period of great persecution on the church. The church suffered during that red horse dispensation. Ran from about 100 to 325 is a good figure. It's the date when uh, I think uh, Const Constantine called a church convention of some kind. They had, he tried to get all the bishops together and get them to all make peace with one another because bishops in different parts of the kingdom were doctrines and competing for power and all of that. All that bad spirit that had crept into the church as it fell away from that perfect spirit that was in that early church. The spirit of Christ had moved out of the church and the flesh was coming in. And uh, there was a lot of persecution. <clears throat> and when he'd opened, well, there was given to him a great sword. It's just they should kill one another. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard them say, come and see. I beheld a black horse. More and more light going out in the church. The church was getting darker. He that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. That's where he said, measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, how, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. We didn't discuss the oil and the wine a while ago, did we? The oil, we say, is the truth, and the wine is the spirit. Be careful with that oil and that wine. Don't lose that. 
Hurt not the oil and the wine. Don't lose the truth. Most people probably lost, lost most of it during that period. But somebody was clinging to the truth even during that period. Somebody clung to the truth. There was somebody close enough to God to know how to overcome the flesh. They may not have known how to explain everything in the book of Revelation, but they knew how to overcome the flesh. And they went all the way with God. He had some witnesses. Somebody's asking, the oil and the wine in this verse, is that the same meaning as in the story in the Good Samaritan in Luke 10? Good Samaritan went and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Well, we, you know, we'd, we'd, we would interpret that parable that way. We would find that as a secondary meaning in it. It really doesn't uh, do anything to support Jesus' point when he told that parable. His point when he told the parable was uh, you need to love your neighbor and take care of your neighbor. And that, that can be taken this far that you're to be concerned about your neighbor's spiritual welfare, not just his natural welfare, but his spiritual welfare. That should give you some inspiration for witnessing for Christ and converting people to the Lord. That's the worst, worst thing they need. They're damaged by sin. So we'll put that with it. Black Horse, that's where we were, 325 to 538. That takes us down to the establishment of the papacy. It was growing into that. The Roman bishop was gaining power all those hundreds of years until finally he became what he was trying to be, the supreme bishop, the leading bishop, the head of the whole church. So that was the origin of the papacy which uh, ruled over the church world for the next 1260 years. <clears throat> 325 to 538. Then we get to the pale horse in verse 8. I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed. Hell followed with him. That church wasn't given much life during that period. That period lasted for 1260 years, 538 to 1798 is the dates we assigned to it. The dates are not literally that important, whether we, but. Uh, If God was explaining it to us, I'm sure he'd make the dates perfect. We, maybe we're getting them close enough. Power was given to him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger. But this is a, a spiritual sword. Hunger hungry for the things of God. Believers in that church in that period, like we were talking about earlier a while ago, people believe in the wrong things, saddled with false doctrine, but they were honest hearted, trying to live right, live the best they could under that false system. And they lost the understanding of the truth. So that's a brief summary of the four horses. The rest of the seven seals go on from there. Revelation 5. Revelation 5. 
Revelations 5. Talking about the beast, the four beasts. first beast, this is where the beasts are described, the first beast was like a lion, and that was that white horse that went forth conquering and to conquer. The lion is a... We're in, we're in chapter 4, verse 7. Verse 4 and 7. The second beast was like a calf, which is a sacrificial animal. That was a period of great persecution and bloodshed in the church. The third beast had a face as a man. That was that black horse when man rulership was taken over the church. Man fallen out of the spirit. The spirit of man was getting control of the church. The bishops were taking over the churches, and one bishop was trying to take over all the bishops, finally did. All that was the face of a man. Man had, had supplanted Christ in the leadership of the church. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. We say that's flying swiftly into the wilderness, just headed deeper into darkness. So all that fourth, fourth horse could do was uh, head deeper into darkness. Now, I don't have to do all this if you've got some things you want to say. Maybe we're not making this clear. We keep getting questions in about somebody's never been in the body and heard the truth but they're as Brother Brown said honest hearted living the best they can what does God do with people like that you're only judged by what you know if you're living all you know that's merit or resurrection God doesn't blame you for being ignorant until you hear what he do. And he's going to inject the truth and impress us. I mean, look at all the technology. That's man showing what he can do. The final resurrection and is for us, for people. There's religion, there's judgment. They just revive us and things. As far as they're not rooted in truth, it's just man showing what he can do. And God has let man do his best. He wants him to find out he can't do good enough. I'm God's not already said, honestly, it's making me nervous. I don't know what to do with all of them. When you start reading the sevens, then you're reading so, about the will of God. What does 666 stand for?
chapter verse 1 it says and if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness whether he hath seen or known of it if he do not utter it then he shall be then he shall bear his iniquity what does that mean I mean the verse number again Leviticus 5 1 it's 5 and what Five and one. <clears throat> this is, uh, first of all, it's part of the law of Moses, and it's, uh, it's built in to that structure of the law of Moses. It fits in with the other laws and regulations because God required them to judge people that swore dishonestly they, they swore in the name of their God and then didn't keep their word didn't keep their promise or they gypped somebody they deceived somebody if uh, you hear somebody do that, you're under the law of Moses, you're required to report it. It's to be judged by the judges. And similar cases, there's other cases pertaining to idolatry and things like that, that had to be, the authorities had to be notified. And if you knew about it, you had to notify them. But this particular verse about swearing is about telling the truth. Jesus said, don't, don't even swear. Just let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. You don't have to swear to back up your word or to convince people that you're telling the truth. You're to live the kind of life that people, on just, they just know you tell the truth. They can, they can trust you. They can depend on you to keep your word. So that's the New Testament version. I have one other question. Um, in Chronicles, it talks about the giants. What ever happened to the giants? Because it, there's like three different, um, uh, I know there's Goliath and his brother, and it also mentions another giant, and they were all killed, but whatever happened to the giants? Whatever happened to what? Oh, the giants? Well, they all got killed. If you keep reading through the books of uh, Samuel, uh, you'll note in there, you'll find over here where they fought another battle and another giant was killed from Gath. And then they fought another battle and another giant was killed. They had one where that had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. One of David's servants killed him. They all wound up getting killed. David was the first giant killer, but he showed them how to do it. He had some giant killers following. In Romans chapter 7, verse 15 through 20, uh, can you explain that and clarify that for me? Uh, the language is difficult for me to understand there. 7 and 20? 15 20. Oh, 15. No, Romans 7, verse 15 through 20. Oh. Oh, 
Well, it starts with verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal. This is Paul talking, standing up for mankind, particularly all the Israelites, because they had the law. The law was given to them. They had the commandment. And Jesus said that was a spiritual commandment. But I'm carnal. I'm a Jew trying to live by the law of Moses. And I'm not spiritual. Sold under sin. I don't want to go too deep here into all this. There's a lot of implications in this passage. But uh, the basic basis of it is that thought that you cannot do it in the flesh. You cannot please God in the flesh. For, as a typical Israelite, that which I do, I allow or I approve not. For what I would or want to do, that do I not. For what I hate, I disapprove of, that's what I wind up doing. Isn't that what you do when you fall into sin? You're ashamed of it later? What I, what I hate, that's what I did. I hate I did that. And that's the condition of every human being born in the flesh. He's showing the need for something else besides the law. If then I do what I wish I didn't, I consent unto the law that it's good. It's a good law. The law of God is good. We ought to do right. We ought to live clean. We ought to treat our neighbors right. We, everybody with any, any uh, humanity even about them would agree to that. Now then, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It looks like he's trying to wiggle out somehow there. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will or to want to is present with me. I want to do right. I want to keep the law. But how to do it, how to perform that which is good, I, I find not when I'm trying to live under the law. For the good that I Want to, I do not. But the evil which I don't want to, that's what I do. That's everybody's problem that's bound in sin. You're addicted. We get hooked on the flesh. For if I do what I don't want to, it's no more I, that is my mine or my will, it's no more my will that's doing it, but sin that dwells in me is making me do that. I find then a law. This is a law. You may try to break it, but you'll have a hard time breaking it. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law, that, that law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, the law that my mind approves and chooses, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He's still describing the condition every Jew was in until he got the Holy Ghost. O oh, wretched man that I am, about ready to give up, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now, we've got two laws there. Note, hold on to those two laws. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Now that's a new thing. Back in Paul's day, that was a new thing, being in Christ Jesus. We've heard about it all our lives, but he was saying something new to most people then. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now that's something you can do. You get the Holy Ghost, you can walk according to the Holy Ghost. Or, here's another law. We already dealt with two laws, now here's a third law. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Did you know that was a law? The law is if you live like Christ, you live forever. That's the law of God. Spirit, law of the Spirit of life. The Spirit is what makes you alive. When you lose the Spirit, you die. You give up the ghost. You give up the Spirit. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, that's what He did it for, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Walking after the Spirit, you can justify the law of Moses. It told you to love your neighbor, told you to love God, told you to treat everybody right. We're fulfilling the law of Moses in the Spirit. It was written about the law of Moses, he that doeth them shall live in them. But nobody ever did them without fail until you got the Holy Ghost. Now you can do it without fail. He that doeth them shall live in them. I ask your question. Uh, it might be a little lengthy, but hopefully you could give me some insight on this. Okay. Um, hopefully you can give me some insight on this. Uh, in, uh, in the book of uh, Genesis, it starts out with Adam sinning, but then uh, in the New Testament, it says that uh, sin came by one man into the world, which I believe was Adam. Why? Should we go ahead, uh, if the third angel, uh, third heaven angels can sin, why should we try to make ourselves perfect if we couldn't, uh, if we would sin after that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, the point there, there is that you're going to have to keep yourself. And so God has given us lots of experience with the suffering caused by sin to convince us not to ever choose sin again. The first sinners had never experienced the results of sin. God has now given us 6,000 years of the results of sin. We don't want to go back to that. Well, an evil, 
we have records of evil spirits doing what we define as sin, even in the Old Testament. God was using them, by the way. God, God uses sinners lots of times. But the time, big, the time, thank God, will come someday when he won't have any sinners to use. But in the meantime, dealing with sinners, God has used sinners to do a lot of things. So he, he used an evil spirit as a sinner. Back there in the days of Ahab, it was, wasn't it? That he wanted deceived. Who's going to trick Ahab into going into battle and getting killed? And so there was an evil spirit there in the presence of God. They... We know that Satan himself was permitted in the presence of God, at least come to the meetings that God called, as far up as the days of Job. But in Revelations, it looks like the time came that Satan lost his, his freedom to come to the meetings anymore. He's cast out down to the earth. He was cast out of heaven, down to the earth. The accuser of our brethren was cast down. Satan was the accuser of the brethren. You see that in Job's case. Satan was Job's accuser. Anybody with any free will is capable of sin. But we, anybody with God's Spirit is capable of choosing not to sin. You have to make that choice. So God is producing people that He can trust to make the right choice. That's, that is a big part of the reason for God's toleration of so much suffering for so long. I'm in numbers and I'm always wanting to know about the red heifer and what the meaning is about her. If you can help us. It's in uh, numbers. numbers 19. Numbers 19. I really don't have much on that myself. One of the things he's showing throughout that chapter is uh, the need for purification. When you fall into sin, you become polluted. Uh, you need some kind of purification. And he, in the law of Moses, they used the blood of animals as a, as a substitute for your own blood, your own life. They gave the life of the animal. The red heifer here has more significance than that, but I don't have enough on it to talk on it except just to point out he's dealing with purification throughout the chapter there are things that defile the person when they're committed and there has to be some purification 
some method of purification devised. So God has devised a method for our purification. In the New Testament, the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Back there, the blood of animals uh, pacified God, in a sense, for their sins, but it did not deal with the power to sin or the power not to sin. I can't satisfy you on that red heifer, but I, I know it's in the news right now. The Jews are breeding red heifers so they can set up their law again. I don't expect God to let them go that far. I don't see that they've got another temple coming. This is preliminary, all this preliminary to their desire to build a new temple in Jerusalem. But the temple was for the Messiah to come to. The Messiah has already come to the temple and that temple has been destroyed. It doesn't need to be rebuilt. The Messiah is still with us. What they need to do is accept that Messiah that came to that temple. They don't need another temple. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. considered a body church well if they meet the body and want to be part of it they can be we accept them as children of God really really everybody that gets the Holy Ghost is born a member of the body of Christ. But usually some other body gets hold of them, puts them in their body, and they never get to merge with the body of Christ. But there's nothing you need to do to join the body is except just fellowship it. Just accept it. Accept that you are part of it. Say it loud. Give him a mic. I su just suggest that the uh, body that you're joined into is identified by the head of that body. Whatever the head of that body is, is the body that you're joined into. So if you're in the body of Christ, the Christ has to be the head. The problem we're having is recognizing the body of Christ, isn't it? Look for that head. Well, of course, the whole book of Revelations, Brother Brown, Brother, Brother, and we're talking about the... Uh, the types and shadows, sorry about that. Uh, he talked about the horses a while ago and then the four beasts over in Revelation 4 using symbolisms and types and shadows to explain it so we could understand it. <clears throat> and we, in the body, I've heard through the years, we, can, we uh, have a lot of light and truth on several of these chapters in the book of Revelations in the beginning and then when we get to 7, 8, and 9 and then 10, we kind of skip over those a little bit. I've heard different brothers through the years 
elaborate and mention some of the symbolism and the truth in those, but the 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 uh, chap, chapter I want to hone in on here, Brother Brown or Brother Wright, that's puzzled me. My question is, uh, well, he was talking earlier about the beast, and uh, he was comparing the horses and the beast. Well, what I'd like to, to know is about the uh, seven angels over in uh, Revelations 8, chapter 8, in uh, verse 2 it mentions, and then it starts in, in verse 7, it mentions the first angel, and I'll just skip on down to the eighth uh, verse, the second angel, and then the ninth verse, the third angel, and then of course in uh, the, the twelfth verse of that chapter 8, it mentions the fourth angel sounding. And the one it elaborates on is the fifth angel. And it goes into a, quite a few verses. <clears throat> and I'm, my first question on those about the angels, are those referring to literal, literal men throughout history? Literal either preachers or the papacy or special gifted men, the early, uh, you know, the apostles, or um, <clears throat> that was, that's my first question. If, is those angels talking about men, in your opinion, or your insight? Um, and then my second part of that question is, uh, get, uh, get past the jitters here. Sorry, I hadn't got up in a while. Um, talked about down there in the chapter 9 um, let me find that verse talked about the scorpions um, and we all know scorpions they have a tail and that's how they inflict their poison is through that through their tail and I found a scripture over in Isaiah 9 and 15 that said the, the prophet that the prophet that speaketh lies, he is the tail. So that's two, my two-part question, Brother Brown. Is the, is the angels referring to literal men? And is that verse 5 of chapter 9 of Revelations, <clears throat> do we have any insight on, on that in, in a symbolic uh, meaning or truth in your opinion? That last verse. Uh, Revelations 9 and 5 about the scorpions striking a man. Is that referring to, is, to that uh, verse in the Old Testament that I referred to? Isaiah 9, 15. Because that's how he, in, the prophet, he strikes with his tail. He's speaking lies. Well, that's uh, what we identify with the tail of the dragon in the 12th chapter. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. That's just false prophets, false teachers, deceiving people, leading them out of the truth. But I don't try to I'm not even going to take a position, a firm position, on whether these angels, you're introducing these things, whether they're uh, persons, individual persons, or movements of people. And I don't claim to be able to give good explanation of all these details in these prophecies right here. I do suggest that you try to mesh these trumpets, these messages of the trumpets with the uh, uh, vials in the 16th chapter. I think the 16th chapter is a repetition of this in different words. It'll help you understand some of it. So this, this is what I say has 
never yet been fulfilled. These uh, things in the seven trumpets here, seven trumpets and the seven vials, I think, are identical and they're yet unfulfilled. And we don't have a good understanding of them. When you start getting into the future beyond your own day, it's hard to explain prophecy. And God really doesn't require that of us very much. The one thing he does complain about is when we can't even explain history. <laughs> Things, prophecy that's already fulfilled. We ought to be able to explain the prophecies that are already fulfilled. But I still reserve these things for the future in this chapter, in the 16th chapter, that they fall in the period <clears throat> between the rapture of the church and the uh, Battle of Armageddon. I think it concludes with the Battle of Armageddon. <clears throat> I think that we we do understand, though, that the in that period uh, after the bride's been called away, it's after that that the the trumpet sound is heard. It comes from these seven angels. It's a message that goes forth, and I believe that it's meant to judge the false system. And that's what the vials are poured out on, is the false system. system. Well, we, we understand that much, at least. question is, um, I was thinking about when the bride gets caught away, when the bride, when the bride gets caught away, uh, what's going to be happening? What, what's the, what, is gonna be, what is the bride going to be doing with the Lord? Is uh, the earth still going to be, you know, people are still going to be here on earth? And um, People go on, get a chance to you know, resurrect, go on to perfection, or whatever. What, but what is the bride and the law going to be doing? To the rapture, when the bride is fully made up. Well, they're preparing for the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we all get to heaven, as the song says, we need a little time to get acquainted, find our place, and uh, the way we're going to work for the Lord there. He'll be setting us in our place, putting us in order. He's getting ready to take control of this earth. Jesus is going to take control of this earth after Armageddon. He's going to set up his kingdom down here on the ground. and. Uh, and bring the earth into, the, into a righteous order within a thousand years. It'll take a thousand years to do that. That little period there between the rapture and the battle of Armageddon is when uh, we'll be just getting acquainted in heaven and getting ready, getting ready to really assist Jesus in ruling the world for a thousand years. We just we got a few minutes left. 
like to address. It's not so much a specific Bible question. I th- I'd like to hear Brother Brown or anybody's comment on this. We're trying to help people. Some, I can't remember if it was yesterday morning or last night, I said something that struck a nerve with people. I've been getting this question all day. It seems like people are having trouble forgiving themselves. And they don't know how to do it. Do you have any advice for them? Well, one thing, I'll remind you that God has forgiven you. And you disagree with God. When God forgives you, you're forgiven. Rejoice. You may say, I'm ashamed of myself. Well, I'm ashamed I did all those things back then, but I'm, I'm happy that God's forgiven me. I'm not, not bound by that anymore. That's not me anymore. I'm a new creature in Christ. goes out to these people. Este yo quisiera que me me pudieran explicar la escritura de Apocalipsis 9:14. The chapter, chapter nine of uh, Revelations. No, versículo 14. Uh, verse 14. Uh, chapter por, nine in Revelations. Por mucho tiempo en mi vida lo he estado leyendo y no lo puedo entender. For many years in my life, I've read it and I would like some more insight on it. Quiero lograr la hoy la oportunidad de escuchar. I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to, to listen. The four angels bound in the great river Euphrates. The way I explain that is that Euphrates represents civil power in this passage because. The Euphrates was the river that Babylon was built on. The Euphrates River made Babylon a great city. And commerce makes movements great throughout history. Even now, the Roman Catholic Church is a commercial enterprise. They're invested in a lot of things. And uh, world commerce, everybody worships it. But uh, the commerce is going to fall apart. You read uh, the 18th chapter of Revelations where it describes the fall of Babylon. That's the time period it's talking about. That's the end of this age, the end of this world. Uh, Whatever has, I think it's there in the 16th chapter, isn't it, where it says that the kings of the east, the way of the kings of the east may be prepared. The Euphrates dries up, that the way of the kings of the east may be prepared. The, to me, the kings of the east means uh, the eastern powers like uh, China and India and Japan, those eastern countries that are becoming powerful, the world powers. Uh, 
for one hour there's to be ten kings agreeing together, maintaining world peace, giving the Roman church, the papacy, its last chance. It's giving it its backing. And uh, when that ten king alliance breaks up and falls apart, <clears throat> there won't be anything, any one nation powerful enough to hold back those kings of the east. <clears throat> God's going to bring them to battle at the battle of Armageddon. And all the nations of the earth are going to be gathered together to battle. It's going to be a great war. Literally, a literal war, world war. That's how this age is going to end up with commerce, and commercial power, and technology, and a lot of things failing and uh, broken down. Civilization is going to suffer. It's going to be a broken world that Jesus comes to take over and take charge of. He's going to have to repair it, rebuild it, because it's been pretty well destroyed in Armageddon. So the Euphrates that I see there just represents the power of world commerce. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, economics falling apart, a world depression, and uh, the breakup of the Ten Kings Alliance that's, that has kept everything functioning smoothly, fall apart. Then the world can be gathered together to battle. And then it's when God will restore the Jew to his place. They'll be in a desperate enough condition. They're going to suffer again and see that they too can fail. They're trusting in their own power now. Israel's trusting in its own economic and military power. They're going to have to see that fail and look like they're going to suffer another, another Nebuchadnezzar or A.D. 70 again, and God will come to their rescue at the last moment when they finally break down and agree to accept Jesus, their Messiah. All they got left, the only, the only hope left is, is their Messiah, Then they'll turn to it. And that will be a change in the world order. And Jesus Christ will rebuild Israel, make them the world's leading nation. And the bride will be working with Jesus in spiritual ways, producing a world of peace and, and progress and uh, spirituality until the end of that thousand years then the holdouts the people that still refuse to be saved still refuse to accept the Lord will be called together in the last great battle called Gog and Magog the battle of Gog and Magog will wipe out that last bit of resistance. Then is when the final resurrection takes place. People come up in a world of peace where the church is in charge. Righteous people are in charge. And uh, in that resurrection, they'll learn the truth that they never learned here, finish overcoming what they never learned here and uh, live on forever 
in a world wherein dwelleth righteousness. We got a long future, started to say history, a long future history. We don't even have any prophetic details about it. God's got a lot for you to do for a long time. I was going to address the uh, question, but the Chad talked about, and I heard him talk about that not just now, but uh, he brought it up in service. And uh, I know him being a pastor, he hears a lot of more things than we hear, a lot of more. He's being a pastor here, so he hears a lot more things. And, uh, but in my life, I've come to find out that when I realize that all my hope, all my trust, when I realize my limitations, that I have to lean on God for everything, and I realize that all my strengths amount to nothing but weaknesses, then I understand that, okay, Lord, I can trust you. I need you. Because everything else I've tried has run out. And I realize that I have a, I have a lack of faith. Trusted in myself, my abilities, had faith in my, my abilities and what I could do. But when that runs, when that ran out and always run out all the time, then I have to try to learn how to really trust the Lord. That's a good point. We've all got to learn to trust God. I just want to add a point that God wants to be able to trust you. Right. Hopefully this will help. This is my testimony about forgiveness. Uh, my mother hated me from the time I was born. Uh, and my father was made to wear Men didn't show emotions, so there was very, very little love in my house. Uh, I was 43 before my father even mentioned the word he loved me. And he only told me that twice my whole life. But uh, I kept going back to Matthew 6 where it said, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And there was no way that I could forgive my mother for the hate. It didn't matter what she did. I couldn't do anything right. There was, I, I'm the middle boy, there was two above me and there was two younger kids. And it didn't make any difference what I did. And I just couldn't, okay, God, how am I supposed to do this? I can't figure out what's wrong. I, I've tried to make her happy. I've tried to do what's right. I can't do it. And with that, there's grown such a hate and such a cold grudge. Uh, and uh, I just, I don't know what to do. I can't do it. And God took and blessed me, it, it, like a big warm curtain come over the top of me. And he said, you can forgive. I forgave you. You can forgive. And that's all it took. He said, but you've got to be honest. And I thought, wait, wait a minute. Why do I have to be honest? I, yeah, I hate her. I mean, ain't that, ain't that honest enough? No, no, no. You, you've got to be honest with yourself. If you can't be honest with yourself, you're not going to be honest with anybody else. You've got to have to take responsibility for everything you do, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. And if you, that's why the Lord takes us through these trials and tests, so we can learn what's inside of us. He only opens up a little bit at a time, but that's all we can handle a lot of times. Sometimes my 
trials and tests get to where they're just right there where I can't bear them anymore. But the Lord showed me that if I can be honest with myself, then I can forgive myself. There's no way that we can forgive ourselves if we can't be honest with ourselves. We need to have that honesty with God, that intimate relationship with the Lord to be able to take and worship Him. So we need to be honest with ourselves. And when we start to be honest with ourselves, then we can forgive ourselves. That's very true. Somebody just texts in, does God forgive you when you've left the church and heard him and then you come back? The point that you came back is proves God's forgiveness, doesn't it? Yes. None of us are here except that God let us come back. But I would encourage people that's suffering with this. There's more people suffering this than you realize. That's right. You're probably sitting next to some of them. It might be you. And people try to serve God this way for a long time. A lot of times there's, you, this is what we're talking about right, right now, you need to search your heart. There's likely a wound or something in your spirit that you haven't resolved yet or you haven't forgiven yet that's breaking your self-esteem. This is a self-image self problem, isn't it? That even when God forgives us, we still can't accept it. But it's likely there's more to it, that there's something in our spirits that's hurt and wounded and there's resentment there and things that we have not resolved yet and those things crush your self-image and your self-esteem. And Everybody, if you're going to be saved, you're going to have to get to the point where you can view yourself the way God views you. He doesn't view you too high, but He don't view you too low either. We're all valuable to the Lord. Aren't we glad we are? We're important to him. We mean something to him. But we've got to view ourselves in the right light. Some of us are too big. We need to get smaller. Some of us are too small. We need to get bigger. I'm just encouraging you to search your heart Ask the Lord to talk to you about why you're in this cycle that you can't seem to, to get past it. You can't seem to get out of it. I had a lot of text calls today that they're good people, they're godly people, people filled with the Holy Ghost, know the truth, but they're suffering with these kind of things. Everybody, there's a way out. Hallelujah. There's a way out. There's a better way to live. God's brought us here where the truth is, where the Spirit is. What a good place we're in. Everybody enjoy Brother Brown tonight? I enjoyed him. Y'all get to hear me all the time. We can't get him to get started very often unless we have a Bible study. We're not going to have one every week or he'll quit talking in them. But we'll have them 
a little more often. But let's take these things home. Study on them. Come up with more questions. Everybody read the Word of God. Keep reading it. Keep studying it. It's life for our souls. All right. Cleaning Wednesday night at 6.30. Right, Abdias? Good night. <laughs>